Jewish Funders Network is a community that grows the size and impact of Jewish philanthropy. We connect funders together, empower individual excellence, and catalyze collective action. We work for a vibrant, meaningful, inclusive, compassionate world. And we strive to bring you information that is timely and relevant, and that is why we are so grateful to our presenters for joining us today to talk about the work and the important work that they are doing right now. Our presenters today are Michael Masters, Executive Director of Secure Community Network, and Daron Horowitz, the Senior National Security Advisor of Secure Community Network. SCN is an initiative of JFNA, which is a JFN member organization. And without further delay, I want to turn it over to Michael. Michael, thank you so much. Tamar, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for all those that are on the call. Uh, good afternoon. As, as Tamar mentioned, my name is Michael Masters, and I serve as the National Director and CEO for the Secure Community Network, the official Homeland Security and Safety Initiative of the Organized Jewish Community in North America. As Tamar noted, we were formed in 2003 and 2004 under the auspices of uh, what is now the Jewish Federations of North America, as well as the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. With that, we have the honor and privilege of working with our over 147 federations around the country, over 50 partner organizations within the conference, and over 300 independent and networked communities to enhance the safety and security of our community. We're all familiar with just over four weeks and a day ago that the calm of a Shabbat morning was broken in Pittsburgh. And with it, so too was the calm across our entire community. For an attack on any Jewish community or institution, regardless of size, affiliation, or location, is an attack on our whole community. It comes amid, that attack came amidst a rise in hate crimes directed against our community and increases in anti-Semitic incidents, appearing everywhere from college campuses to political campaigns. The Tree of Life congregation truly represented its name as dozens of individuals gathered on October 27th from three different congregations to meet in peace and prayer, as well as in celebration across the building. As we have, over the last several weeks, mourned the senseless loss of life, as well as the injuries that occurred, we also recognize the value of working together to address the threats that we face across our whole community and coming together as different organizations. For that reason, we're particularly honored to join you here today to talk a little bit about the work that we are doing, but more importantly, the work that institutions and communities are doing across the country and how we are working with them collectively to enhance the safety and security of organizations and institutions, many of which uh, you as supporters and funders are helping to make their work possible. So SCN, uh, our mission is very simple. It is to enhance the safety and security of the Jewish community in North America. Uh, I was honored and privileged to take over as the new national director and CEO a year and a week ago, um, or rather a little less than a year and a week ago, December 4th of, of last year. And in this past 11 and a half months, close to 12 months, we have worked very diligently to undertake a strategic organizational redesign of SCN. Our board uh, and our founding partners in JFNA and the conference recognized a need for an SCN that was more proactive and more forward-leaning and working with our partners and communities around the country. I'm joined by dedicated members of our team, our Deputy Director and COO, Patrick Daly, our Senior National Security Advisor, Deron Horowitz, who we'll hear from in a few moments, and our Chief of Staff, Dina Weiss. And we've been working over the last 11 months to reorganize SCN, to build upon its work that it's done over the last 15 years but also ensure that we are most effectively supporting our communities around the country, from our biggest cities to our smallest independent and networked communities. With the purpose of fostering a culture of empowerment, collaboration, and vigilance across the Jewish community. Simply working to protect today to secure for a secure tomorrow, ensuring that people as they walk into our Jewish institutions and organizations feel safe and comfortable in being able to worship, send their kids to day school, summer camps, place individuals in senior housing, walk into a Jewish affiliated hospital, and guarantee that over the next coming years and generations, we have a strong and vibrant community that is able to carry on our traditions and values for future generations. The activities that we engage in to accomplish this 
We're guided by four principles, awareness, protection, preparedness, and resiliency. The activities that we undertake, information and intelligence sharing, assessments, training, consultation, incident management, and response. And we undertake these activities in a strategic security framework, working with organizations and communities to address all of these different areas. There is no magic one solution that people can have to ensure the safety and security of an organization or a community. We've had literally every single day since October 27th, about 25 to 75 requests for information or service from across our community. Uh, and they, they involve everything from requests for working to develop strategic frameworks to what should I do about hiring a security guard? And what we like to stress to everybody is that we need to create a culture of safety and security in our community to address the threats that we face so that when people walk into our institutions, the people that are there to go to school or pray or work out in a gym at a JCC can do that while being situationally aware but not worried about their safety, able to embrace a Jewish life and our values. And that really gets to protecting the centers of Jewish life that we have in our community from houses of worship to community centers, senior centers, college campuses, and workplaces. Duran, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, in addition to serving as our senior national security advisor, he also oversees our camp campus safety initiative. The CSI works with organizations such as Hillel International, Chabad, AEPI, and, uh, J and through JFNA, as well as other Jewish organizations on our campuses around the country to help ensure the safety and security of Jewish students and Jewish student organizations from the increase in anti-Semitic incidents and hate crimes that we see around the country, as well as violence directed at Jewish students. I mentioned us working together for a safer, stronger community. This gives you a sense of how we like to work with organizations and what we have found to be effective. And what we would encourage is you look at organizations and programs with respect to the work that all of you do in funding programs that we start to think collectively as a whole community, how can we ensure the safest and most secure community? How can we create that embedded sense of safety and security? So we work to socialize the concept of safety and security with the community to do it in a way that is empowering. And that's through lay leadership as well as professional leadership. We then work to undertake an assessment of communities and organizations, getting a baseline of where their strengths and their weaknesses are so that we can work to address those, whether it's through infrastructure, policies and procedures, or training, and then the development of that strategic plan that doesn't deal with just today or tomorrow, but for the coming weeks and months. One of the things that we've heard a great deal from, and, and you may have heard from, from your uh, stakeholders, well, how are we gonna pay for security? And our common refrain is, well, how do we pay for landscaping? How do we pay to keep the lights on? Safety and security is one of our most fundamental obligations as institutions. Uh, and certainly for the institutions that you all work with. And it's one of the areas that we want to create that culture so that it becomes an embedded part of what we do and how we think about things. A place where that happened and where it has been done effectively and efficiently was actually in Pittsburgh. We benefited over the course of the last 15 years, SCN has worked diligently to work with local communities to develop out security programs and also to increase our network of security directors around the country. When SCN was started in 2003 and 2004, there were two full-time security directors in communities across the United States. Today, there's over 35. And we're benefited from Pittsburgh of having one of the most diligent, forward-leaning individuals that was put into one of those positions in our colleague, Brad Orsini. So just to give you a sense of our historic engagement with Pittsburgh as, as a reference point or a case study, the security director there, Brad, was onboarded in 2017. SCN helped with his recruitment, interviewing, and hiring, as we've done with over 60% of the security directors around the country. We've then worked uh, with Brad on a variety of different areas, and as Brad has also undertaken his own program, I had the good fortune of spending some time with him in June, this past June, where we talked extensively about his commitment to training uh, and working with communities to undertake assessments traveling sometimes by, for hours to do assessments at Jewish day, day camps and summer camps around the Pennsylvania area. So there's been a long relationship with Pittsburgh and with Brad. Does it give you an idea of the activities that Brad has undertaken at all of the different types of uh, Jewish centers that exist within our communities? 
as you can see on the right, everything from those facility assessments, situational awareness briefings, high holiday briefings, hate crimes training, active threat training, stop the bleed training, civil rights training. In 20, from 2017 to date, Brad conducted over 125 training sessions, reaching over 5,600 individuals in the different types of institutions to include undertaking training at the Tree of Life Synagogue in the months before the events that happened there last October, 20, this past October 27th. To give you a sense of how we operate, and I wanted to run you through this to give you an instructive idea of how an event unfolds. So at 10.50 on the morning of October 27th, that is when the offender walked into Tree of Life Within seven minutes, we as an organization were in communication on the developing incident. We were in touch with Brad in Pittsburgh. Within 23 minutes, we had distributed a flash report from our duty desk across the Jewish community around North America. Within about 30 minutes, I had been in touch with the assistant director at the FBI and the deputy undersecretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security with whom we maintained contact for the coming hours and, of course, the coming days and weeks. We were also in contact with senior leadership throughout the community as well as stakeholders. Within one hour, the local Pittsburgh community had asked if we could deploy uh, to support their efforts in this crisis. Duran, who you'll hear from, was on the road in under 60 minutes. He reached Pittsburgh within between two and a half and three hours, and he remained there for the better part of the week. We continued to work releasing situation reports from our duty desk to organizations around the country. And why I want to highlight this is, you know, SCN is a network, but we are a network within a network. And that broader network is our entire Jewish community, from JCCs that are receiving information to Hillel's and Chabad's, uh, to our independent day schools, through our Prisma network and other organizations. One example of this is everyone is probably very familiar. Um, one of the issues that came up with the attack was events that were conducted by Hyas and the mentioning of Hyas by the offender in the, in, in the incident. Almost immediately, we were on the phone with local law enforcement in both the New York uh, area as well as the Washington DC area because of the location of Hyas's office to ensure heightened security presence and attention to their facilities in the immediate aftermath of the attack. We did the same thing by analyzing where Hyas events were occurring in the weeks following the attack to ensure local law enforcement in those cities to include Washington, D.C., New York, and Chicago, were aware of those events that were going on. The next 36 hours, we undertook very similar activities of intelligence and information sharing and working closely with the community, in addition to convening a number of briefing calls to include with the, form, with, uh, the director of the FBI and senior leadership at DHS, as well as a briefing for our security directors around the country. We've continued to do that uh, reaching, providing information and analysis to our stakeholders and partners. We've conducted multiple uh, phone calls and presentations collaboratively with the ADL, the Conference of Presidents, Hillel, uh, local organizations from the East Coast to the West Coast, reaching over 1,300 participants in our rabbinical and synagogue movements, as well as the Orthodox Union, JCCs, as well as collaboratively with DHS uh, and other entities, all in an effort to share best practices and information so our local organizations can be best prepared, not just for an event, but to address the sentiment of the community and concerns that have obviously arisen in the last several weeks. Talk about supporting. One of the major things that we're working to do is support our local communities. So in the aftermath, last August, is everyone will recall the events in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, SCN was on the ground in Charlottesville within 24 hours of that torchlit rally that we all can remember so well. Since then, we've worked continuously in an ongoing fashion with the community in Charlottesville. At the Unite the Right rally anniversary this past year, we were in Charlottesville and Washington, D.C., supporting both communities. When I went to Charlottesville earlier this year, one of the things I heard from the local community was they were aware of this broader network, this broader Jewish community, but at the end of the day, they felt incredibly alone. As they stood on the steps of Congregation Beth Israel and looked across this little tree-lined street and saw armed neo-Nazis and neo-Confederates 
uh, waving swastikas and Confederate flags and armed with assault rifles, their feeling was one of complete isolation. Our commitment is that no community anywhere will feel that same sense of isolation. I think we've done a good job in Charlottesville of making sure that wasn't the case and supporting our communities, which is exactly what we work to do in Pittsburgh. Right now, I'd like to turn it over to Duran, who was on the ground, as I mentioned, within two and a half to three hours of the events at Tree of Life, to share a little bit of his perspective of the events there um, and what the community has gone through. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share with you what I witnessed firsthand on the ground and what I've witnessed actually in the last two and a half years since coming full time aboard for SCM. As Michael said, uh, within an hour I hit the road, and uh, being Israeli, I, I didn't have to necessarily adhere to the speed limit, therefore, I was able to arrive a little bit quicker. Um, but through that, through driving on the highway, I, I recalled all the different incidents that I had experienced here and, and what I experienced in Israel in order to get my mind ready to hit the ground running and help a community in need. I remember being in Irvine in 2016 when Jewish students in screening of a film beneath the helmet were literally intimidated and threatened and barricaded inside a hall and had to literally be escorted under heavy police security to ensure their physical safety and security. I remember being in Charlottesville. I remember being in Towson following an attack on two Jewish students of AEPI by another fraternity and they were charged with a hate crime. I remember the bomb threats occurring and how much it shook the community and how much people didn't want to go to a JCC following that. I remember being in Orlando and working with the community in fear following an ISIS-inspired like attack. And while you're thinking about all those incidents and many, many more that have occurred from threats and emails and flyers and, and vandalism and graffiti and ongoing increasing kind of threatening environment, we still have to keep a level head. While you're thinking about that, I've now arrived in Pittsburgh. I arrived in Pittsburgh at the JCC in the late afternoon. And as soon as I walked in, the JCC was literally turned into a command center. It was a difficult scene to witness. The JCC turned into victim unit, a, a witness collection point, victim services, a family reunification center. Mental health, of course, was a resources, Red Cross, FBI and local law enforcement were all over the place. People from the community were coming in and out, just not knowing what happened. Family members of the victims were being brought in with a tremendous amount of chaos and pain. My only point of reference for this kind of incident was in Israel. I fought in Operation Defensive Shield in 2001 and 2002, and I was involved with, as a first responder in, in a counter-terror unit. And I recall, and there's immediate associations and flashes back to that moment so that I have a point of reference. I remember in Israel looking at the faces of civilians, mothers and brothers and children and parents of sadness and anger. But there was something more that I saw firsthand here, as I saw in other communities following these incidents. It was fear. Not just shock, but fear. Helplessness. That look will never escape me. That whole JCC, the whole community was impacted. Law enforcement was impacted. A couple of hours in, a rabbi, a, the local rabbi in charge of the burial, uh, services with a member of the Hatsala team requested to go see the body so that they can make the necessary arrangements. So only due to the fact that the community security director Brad was a 28-year veteran of the FBI 
and his uh, relationship with local law enforcement were we permitted to go into the synagogue or what was referred to as the crime scene. We, we arrived at the synagogue. The FBI uh, person in charge there, very nice lady, she told us, you know, of course we had to put on some rubber, uh, I mean, plastic boots. And she said, I'm just preparing you that this is a very difficult scene. I remember the Hatsala guy who was Israeli looked at me and I looked at him and he said to me in Hebrew, Kadima Otpam, again. <clears throat> I had walked into the synagogue, walked amongst 11 dead bodies in pools of blood. But the men wrapped still in their talit. I should say that the gunmen used an automatic rifle or semi-automatic rifle, which caused a tremendous amount of horrific scenes and impact to flesh and bones that some of the deceased and murdered were not recognizable. I am the son of Nomi. She was a messenger girl for the Haganah. I am the nephew. My uncle fought, those of you who may know on this call, in Gush Etzion, the convoys to Jerusalem in 1948. As a proud Israeli growing up, I didn't want to hear, and I'm just being very honest with you, I didn't want to hear about the Holocaust. Not as a proud Israeli, not as someone that served as many years and come from a family that had served with a tremendous amount of honor and a privilege. But at the age of 54, in the year 2018, in a beautiful Jewish community in Pittsburgh, I witnessed firsthand the Holocaust. There was people clinching still a sidur in a pool of blood. It is a very difficult scene and one that still is difficult for many people to understand what occurred just a month ago. It was a massacre of Jews that even some members of the community referred to as, oh, we lost 11 people or 11 people died. Ladies and gentlemen, it was much more than that. And I recall, I recall a call that the ADL uh, put on in terms of statistics, that there are thousands upon thousands of people that subscribe to this radical ideology, Nazi ideology, just like this individual did, that also have weapons. I will take you out of that synagogue right now because I had a job to do. My job was, of course, to mourn the dead, but my job is towards the living. We came out of the synagogue and there was spontaneous vigils being held right outside. And I remember being approached by a woman and a man together with uh, Brad Orsini, the community security director, she goes, do I send my kids to school tomorrow? We don't know what to do. And there, highlighted and accentuated to the highest degree was what we do here every day. Our mission is to ensure that kids from pre preschool to the elderly have to go to our locations to our agencies, to our JCCs, to our camps, to our schools. That's our responsibility. That's my responsibility. The, last, the, 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 next, the following days was all about engagement face-to-face -face with those who didn't know what to do, what to think, how to act. And we often make two critical mistakes following an incident like this. One is 
is that we don't recognize the severity of what occurred. And so our response is oftentimes misguided because it's guided by emotions. So we throw a tremendous amount of resources and not achieving a sustainable level of reason and order and achieving a, a healthy balance. We don't want to turn our institutions into fortresses. It defeats the purpose of Jewish life and the quality of Jewish life that we all work hard to attain. The other thing that we make a mistake is that we forget. And we don't create a deterrence factor. We don't contribute to resiliency and empowerment. And we need to shift our focus from helplessness and shock and fear and confusion to something that Michael mentioned before, which is resiliency, education, empowerment, that we actually have a tremendous amount to say when it comes to our own safety and security. And it cannot be done with emotions. It has to be with a sustainable level of reason and logic so that our kids can grow up with the same qualities that all of you contribute on this phone call to ensure that we have a quality of life that's intelligent and mature and strong. That's our greatest deterrent. We're not just training people of what to do. We're training people how to think. Critical thinking in a moment of pressure makes all the difference. It's not just what to do, but how do I do it? If I'm able to teach people to think, it's very much teaching people how to fish instead of just giving them fish. I know that many of you have questions, and I don't want to take too much of your time, but in the absence of that reasonable level of approaching security, together with our strong partnership with law enforcement and the expertise that we maintain, my mission is very clear. Whether it's Irvine or Orlando or Charlottesville or Gainesville or Whitefish, Montana, that parents send their kids to school the next day so that when they grow up, they will send their children to school. I thank you for your time, and I will pass it back to you, uh, Michael. Zaron, thank you uh, very, very much, and to both for your service and your support to the Pittsburgh community as well as many other places been in a time of need and every day, which is a time of need. I think the, the criticality of what we're working to do is embedding that mindset and culture of safety and security into our community. And candidly, we, we need your help uh, in doing that. The reach that each of you and your organizations have with individual communities and the organizations that you support is incredibly persuasive and powerful. Um, where we can work together to ensure that organizations, as they're thinking through their programs, as they're thinking through how do we deliver quality educational programs, how do we deliver quality uh, imaginative programs, how do we support local communities, what is the security component that goes along with that? Just as when we get on an airplane or you get on a, a, a ship, there's a safety briefing, or if you come to a JFNA board meeting and our board chair points out where the exits are and what to do in emergency, <laughs> we need to ensure that we are creating within the organizations organically, uh, in their programs, in their, in their uh, programmatic initiatives, a security component that is ensuring the longevity of our community uh, and that these programs can exist for generations to come. From our end, that involves building trust. It involves assessing need. It works on empowering individuals, organizations, and communities, and then, of course, supporting one another through collective action. So just to give you a sense of over the last couple of weeks, some of the things that that's involved, we, of course, are always collaborating with our partners in the federal government from the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, 
uh, local, state, private sector, nonprofit partners at all levels, uh, connecting organizations and institutions with their local law enforcement, ensuring that we're getting information to them on best practice, whether it is a school or a house of worship. My first couple weeks on this job, our then board chair at JFNA, Richard Sandler, asked me what I'd learned from the communities I'd, I'd been to, and my response was, I've learned that when you've seen one community, you've seen exactly one community. And I think the same is true for, for organizations because of how unique and particular they are in sentiment and programming and direction and leadership. Uh, but there are best practices and we can work to proliferate those best practices across our networks uh, collaboratively. And also supporting requests. So if an entity is holding a special event, whether it's Maccabi Games or community gatherings or uh, concerts, what are they doing with respect to special event planning? How are they thinking about looking at natural and man-made events? Because this isn't just about man-made disasters or terrorist attacks. It's about making sure that our schools are prepared for uh, wildfires like we see in California. The mass notification system that we've deployed to over 57 Federation communities has been most widely used. While it was used on the day of the Tree of Life attacks, it has been most widely used during natural disasters in Florida and during the bomb threats that occurred last year. So how do we make sure that those policies and procedures are an embedded part of our of our culture so that we find them to be, as we do with fire drills, we don't scare our children by talking to them about what happens to a school in a fire. We empower them by giving them skill sets and education about what to do during a fire drill. And I would bet that if all of us had a fire drill going on in our buildings right now, even though that we are separated by time, distance, location, we would probably each do the same things because we've been trained to do the same things. We've built that muscle memory in and we don't find it to be frightening, we find it to be an empowering skill set that we can use. Similarly, we have to do assessments on our organizations and within our communities. This year, we started as an organization a heavy push to do that. We conducted over 35 assessments, um, 35 assessments in 35 individual communities, I should say. Some communities range from having a few organizations, as you know, to dozens. Um, this also has ROI for organizations. Thanks to our partners at the Department of Homeland Security, there are grant funds available to help organizations uh, to in make investments in critical infrastructure upgrades, but it requires some work on our end, but that's something that we can work to do, that we actually increase the capacity of organizations by providing them the tools to get funding from the federal government and other sources. Of course, the most important thing that we feel is necessary is empowerment. Just a sense of some of the training that we do is listed on this uh, on the slide in front of you. Everything from safety and security practices, so me trying to convince my 10-year-old daughter not to keep her head buried in her iPhone uh, and being situationally aware to making sure that our volunteers who are uh, staffing the desks at our community centers or at our senior facilities are aware to be on the lookout for suspicious behavior not just from a terrorist event, but because we have over 750,000 registered sex offenders in this country. And we wanna make sure that we're putting in proper risk management programs in order to avoid any of those individuals uh, from causing harm to our community members. And below you see some of the partners uh, from our campus security initiative, as well as one of our, uh, we're honored to work with Prisma on a, on a regular basis regarding our Jewish day schools, at least a segment of our independent Jewish day schools around the country. And lastly, there's the supporting one another through collective action. So Duran mentioned some of the some of the places that we have been. Uh, Whitefish, Montana, Overland Park, Kansas, Charlottesville, Virginia, Pittsburgh, uh, places that you know we, in, we would all wish we didn't have to be uh, responding to an incident, but when it happens, we need to be there as a system and as a network, and it, kind of, it involves all of us coming together. There's a saying in the Marine Corps that Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. We have an opportunity to prepare and we cannot afford to fail, either as organizations or as a community, because we cannot afford the outcome of people being not willing to send their kids to Jewish state schools, not willing to come to synagogue, not willing to send their kids to Jewish overnight camp, from parents discouraging their kids from joining traditionally or historic fraternities and sororities like AE Pi or AE Phi, we have to build a culture that is res resilient 
uh, and we do that through empowerment and supporting one another. We're often guided in our thoughts by the statement from Rabbi Hillel that we all know so well, now is the time, if ever there was one, for us to come together collaboratively to work with our organizations around the country to work to ensure that this culture, this sense of safety and security becomes an embedded and inherent part of everything that we do. As we have had to do in years past and generations past, we have faced great threats as a community, but we have overcome them. And we will overcome the current threats that we face, but our greatest threat comes not externally, it is internal. It is our own sense of denial that these events are possible, and then our unwillingness to prepare for them. If we prepare and we empower one another, we can confront the challenges in front of us. And that is what we are working to do. And we look forward to continuing working to do it so that we can create, as JFN points out, vibrant, meaningful, inclusive, interconnected, creative, compassionate communities and a world that adheres to those same values. I think we'll, we'll pause there and open it up for questions. We're very grateful for the time. And if we can be of assistance now on the call or, or later, um, independently, we're happy to, to serve as a resource. Okay. Thank you so much, Michael and Doron, for your, for your work and for your presentations. It's very thought-provoking um, and important for us to have this conversation. Just wanted to remind everybody that you can ask some questions on the bottom of your screen in the Q&A, and I will, I will um, go through them and, and facilitate some questions and answers right now. So we do have a few that have come in. One is, says that 35 security directors were for us referenced as critical local resources. What do we do for communities, federations, that don't have a full-time security director and those that may be too small to justify one? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, that is a fantastic question. And it is something um, that, you know, frankly, one of the first things that, uh, that our team did after our leadership transition was we mapped out that those locations of those security directors and you know, from two to 35 is a lot of progress, but we live in a big country with over 5.7 million Jews and that's a lot of area to cover. And certainly it's too big for 35 people. One of the programs that we've innovated, um, we've worked with the Department of Homeland Security on over the last year was referred to as our regional security advisor program. So. The Department of Homeland Security has what's called protected security advisors. They divide the country into a series of regions, um, recognizing from incidents like Overland Park, Kansas, like Charlottesville, like Whitefish, that the greatest threats we often see are not necessarily concentrated in urban areas, but are in smaller or independent communities or those communities that can't necessarily resource their own assets. Uh, in June, we worked with the Jewish Community Partners of Memphis. They have a phenomenal federation executive, Laura Linder. Uh, we worked to pilot a program, our regional security advisor program. We co-resourced a regional security advisor, RSA, uh, who is based out of Memphis. He works out of the Memphis Federation. He's got a phenomenal background in local law enforcement. He served in the IDF. Um, has served on a number of terrorism task forces in his career. He works out of the Memphis Federation. He services the Memphis community, but he is available as a regional asset for the entire region. And he has worked on a number of regional issues that have arisen. Uh, and in fact, because of his familiarity with uh, local law enforcement and where he was situated, he helped support operations in Charlottesville. We're expanding that program right now. Uh, we are currently in conversations uh, it's farther than conversations. We are, we are currently in hiring processes for three additional regional security advisors that will cover the Atlantic coast, um, as well as parts of the Pacific Northwest. And we are looking at how we can expand that program over the next uh, 12 to 36 months to cover the entire country to address exactly that need. Where there are discrete, now that's, that's a great plan for 36 months. Uh, that said, we often don't live in the timelines that we would like. We live in other people's timelines. Uh, if there are organizations or incid incidents or communities that need assistance in the interim, that is our role as, uh, as an organization. And frankly, that is the power of the collective system. 
right? The value of the federation system and the conference and our partners is that we come together to service those who cannot independently on their own uh, necessarily service themselves. And so we are always available to assist and support communities as we have been doing in the dozens of requests that we've gotten, hundreds of requests that we've gotten since uh, the tragic events in Pittsburgh. Okay, thank you. Another question that came in said, my initial research indicates that the local security directors reach impact may be based on some extent to their budget allotment from the local federations and that there's a wide differential in security budget even among similar sized communities. What do we make of this? What are the right benchmarks? Another great question. Um, so we are, we convened a, a, a security director summit two weeks before Pittsburgh happened uh, in October in Washington, DC. We brought together the largest percentage of security directors from around the country that had ever been brought together. And one of the things that we did, we had a series of working groups and sessions which brought those security directors in to focus on discrete verticals, uh, intelligence information sharing, uh, critical incident management, training, uh, et cetera. And the goal of that is actually, the goal of that process, and that was the beginning of a process, those committees and working groups was to create a baseline of what a security director requires for their program, what a, what a well-funded security program, because certain, at the end of the day, certain communities may not necessarily need a security director, but they will, everyone needs a security program. Um, what does a security program look like? What are the baselines that need to be met? How do you meet them? That is an ongoing process that we are underway in right now. Uh, we would welcome the participation or engagement of other entities to help move that along uh, or to offer feedback and, and suggestions on how it can be uh, promoted or enhanced. Okay, thank you. Another question that came in, I think you mentioned something in your last answer that might my piggyback on this, but a couple of smaller organizations have told me that their biggest short-term need is funding for security guards. This is an ongoing program cost that can be difficult to fund. What guidance do you have for these organizations, such as synagogues with small budgets? Should there be a response to help organizations hire short-term security personnel? More broadly, is it now recommended for all Jewish institutions to hire full-time security personnel outside of the regional level security directors? Or is this an overreaction? I guess in adding on to this, if there's yep. a few other just next steps that you would suggest um, for everybody on the call to be thinking about, um, that would also be great to add. Thank you. Sure, Tamir. Thank you. Um, so the, the short answer, if there is a short answer, and I'm a lawyer by training, so there's no such thing as a short answer for me, um, as my wife reminds me. Uh, the the reality is, is that every community is different. Every organization is unique. So going back to what I said earlier, there is no one size fits all solution. Um, it is why we encourage in our process, a, the first thing we wanna do before I even talk to a community is go around to the community and see what their institutions look like, uh, identify how their organizations are operating. And the, that's critical for a variety of reasons. The assessment is the most critical thing. It would be short-sighted to say, yes, everyone should have a security guard, when the reality is a lot of organizations, one, it's, it's not viable for them just with respect to resources, but two, are we locking our doors? Um, are we paying attention to other simple efforts that need to be undertaken? And then at the end of the day, it comes down to ensuring that you're taking a comprehensive or holistic approach to security. So I'll go back to, to what we know, despite the tragic loss of life and the injuries that occurred in Pittsburgh, within, in the year prior to the event there, that facility had undergone a threat assessment. They had undergone active threat, active shooter training. From that training, they had implemented protocols that came out of that training. There were people in synagogue that day that attribute the reason why they are alive today to the training that they received and they implemented. 
at the end of at the end of the day for us, we need to take that comprehensive approach. Within 90 seconds to two minutes, law enforcement responded to the events in, in Tree of Life. It's a phenomenal law enforcement response and we, we have to give credit to the Pittsburgh Police Department, not only for their everyday service, but the, the incredible work that the officers did that, that day. But within that first four officers arriving on scene, the offender shot four officers, including two SWAT officers, uh, all highly trained. And what that demonstrates to us is that, you know, even within 90 to two minutes, 90 seconds to two minutes, when confronted with highly trained, very well equipped personnel, armed law enforcement that are trained for this type of response, uh, that when confronted with that response, all of whom were, se were injured, some severely, this can't be our only response. So it involves multiple layers of doing things. So we, we would suggest uh, one, there is no one, one size fits all response. We have to take a comprehensive approach that starts with assessments, it involves training, it can involve uh, security presence or safety personnel, but all of these things are distinct to the building itself and how it operates. Michael, let me just add, if I may, to even drill down in the, as a result of the community security director in line with our policies and the way we train, the, the, the community security director urged the rabbi to carry his phone, which he was very resistant to for a long time. But after urging him, and training and working with his congregation. The rabbi carried his phone. The first 911 call made was from the rabbi in his phone. Michael? I think that emphasizes the training and the criticality. So, I, in, ter oh, in terms of immediate next steps, so I think that it's, it's vital that you know, organizations develop policies and procedures and plans that they have a strategy. And that doesn't mean a plan that sits on a shelf. I, we're not looking for an, uh, an 18 volume plan that no one's gonna ever read. People need to think through operationally, if something happens, who's calling 911? Just as, as Brad had that rabbi do. I mean, to say, who is going to be able to call 911? And who's that person? If, if you have an event that's going on in a school and you're a teacher, what does locking down your classroom look like? What does that functionally look like for you? And then you learn the deficits and you do that assessment and then you work to train towards those deficiencies and train towards the strengths to, to enhance those as well. Um, so th those are some next steps. We have a lot of materials that we, we make available. We've pushed out through the many webinars that we've done. We're happy to make those available to anyone that's on the call. There's low cost um, security enhancements. We have a, a short document on low to no cost security enhancements for facilities, uh, best practices on training, and then we're happy to work with partners and other entities on holistic security and safety programs. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I want to thank um, everybody that participated and, have, and thank the presenters for all the work that they're doing and for sharing their knowledge with, with the group. And I appreciate the offer for you to sharing a lot more of that knowledge. Please, people, be in touch with me if you want to get in touch with either of our presenters or for any of those resources. We will be able to share that on our website and share that with all of you as we all start thinking about security in, in a lot of different ways. So thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.